Okay, folks, it's your buddy Mike Messier. Saw the movie Late Night with the Devil tonight. Um, horror fans, I think you'll like this one. Non-horror fans, you probably won't. I think it's one of those clearly divide ones. Is it an awesome all-time classic? I don't think so. I think it could have been. I'm not sure what exactly it's missing. It's a lot of style, <clears throat> 70s style. I do like the story. I just feel like there's a little, I don't know, just something feels like it's missing from this one. And uh, spoilers, I mean, I'll, I'll probably give this a three, three and a half, something like that, three and a quarter out of five stars. But, um, and I liked it, I enjoyed it. I just felt like there was a little something, a little punch in the balls that was missing. And I think what that might have been is the backstory on this um basically the film is making references to i think it was called coconut grove or some such craziness years ago i think it was good old alex jones made like a documentary about this which was kind of what put him on the map of conspiracy theories and so forth but basically you had this island of creeps and politicians and all that who would do these weird tribalistic things. That's real life, by the way, I'm discussing, as far as I know. And um, these human beings would go to this island and dance around in a circle with a tiki hut and all this crazy horse shit. And Alex Jones kind of exposed this, and I, I want to say that the Clintons and some other high powers were in on this, and it was all men on a weird island. So basically the movie, this flash-forwarding or flashbacking to this movie, references this situation but because this is a found footage movie of sorts uh we don't really explore that meaning this island that is supposed to be where our host there was the cause you know made a deal with the evil spirits to like basically i think give up his wife in exchange for ratings or or power or fame I don't know, it's not very clear. I mean, they do have a scene towards the end of the movie where his pact with the devil is kind of exposed by this memory of the dying wife of cancer. I, it just seemed like one too many elements. Um, if we're not gonna go to the fucking Coconut Grove Island, right? If we're not gonna see scenes there exposing him making the devil or the pact with the devils or the, the demonic spirits, then leave it out of the fucking movie. You know what I mean? It's just like one too many goddamned elements. If you're going to have this extra layer of an, of the onion of the story, find filmmakers, then you have to show us that. You can't just tell us that. And I know their fucking excuse would be, oh, it's found footage, blah, blah, blah. Well, then you don't need to make reference to this whole other thing if you're not going to follow through with it. I mean, that's... That's one thing about movies, folks, and, and, you know, just storytelling, especially with the film. It doesn't really work. For the filmmaker, it works. For the, you know, the, the director or the producer, they want to save money. And they figured, oh, we'll just throw this line of dialogue in to cover this base or to, you know, this element of the story. We'll just have a character say it. But it's, it's the age-old, you know, show-don't-tell prophecy or mantra. Just, it... And I guess what I would also say is you don't you did not the film fuckers the makers of this film and you had some big budget behind this thing because uh, our buddies there the ones that make every goddamn horror film now uh, not Bloomhouse but the other uh, Shutter it's like um, you, if you didn't if you weren't going to follow up and really explore this whole issue of the fucking Coconut Grove Island of the Island of Creeps. If you weren't going to go there, then don't go there. Then don't reference it. And they could have made this movie just fine without referencing it. It could have been just done some other way, you know? That's my feeling. So I feel like as good as the special effects were in this thing, the the, the actress, she was supposed to be playing a 13-year-old. If I had to imagine, I would think that the actress was more like 18 or 20 years old, maybe even older. Um... I thought she did a great job playing the kind of possessed kid. The guy playing the skeptic was good. Uh, the guy playing the, the Ed McMahon type, the second banana, was really good. The guy playing the lead guy was good. 
So, I mean, all these actors, I hadn't seen really any of them. I couldn't place any of their faces. Although, the woman playing the dead wife, um, I kept thinking that that was the chick from uh, Meet the Parents and Meet the Fockers. Like, the really, uh, the guy, or the woman that played Ben Stiller's wife, or fiance, in the Meet the Parents movies. Uh, she was a very, very gorgeous woman. And I was basically watching this movie thinking, man, she looks the same. She looks just as good. Well, it's not the same fucking actress, you know. It's a look-alike, a facsimile. So, I mean, if you were familiar with the whole thing with Margot Robbie, Margot Robbie, Margot, and um, Jamie Lee Presley from a prior generation, uh, they look very similar, except Margot Robbie's career is basically A-list, and uh, Jamie Lee Presley basically... You know, she just got caught up in kind of these uh, skin flicks and so forth and eventually made a sitcom and so forth. I think it was My Name is Earl, which I never watched. But basically, Jamie uh, Lee P Lynn Presley pretty much it looks almost exactly like Margot Robbie or close enough. And these actresses, the chick from Meet the Parents, Meet the Fockers, and she was in a lot of other stuff. Um, she... So her career probably peaked in, I don't know, 2000, 2001, 2002. So flash forward 20 years later, she has a facsimile. This actress who's in this movie playing the dead wife. I really thought it was the same person, but it's not. This actress in the one in, in this film, the, the Late Night with the Devil, her name is like uh, G Georgina, some such thing. And I can't uh, remember the actress's name from Meet the Parents or Meet the Fockers. Anyway, but yeah, the guy playing the guy looked good. The guy playing the lead guy in this. The voiceover part at the beginning was good. And I I was, you know, I was in a theater. It was pretty well packed. I'll give you fans a little helpful hint. Uh, just someone entering their car over there. They have like this lime green car of some kind. Uh, you don't see that every day. But basically, um, the theater was kind of crowded and I actually did something I normally don't do, you know, because you're not supposed to, unless you actually have a real live handicapped person with you, you're not supposed to sit in those assigned chairs for their companions. But I did the math. It was 7.30 p.m. was the movie was starting. I got my ticket at 7.26. There was a whole other, you know, section for handicapped and handicapped companion seating and when I looked at the map to reserve my seat, because you have to do that now, the only real seat that I could sit in was like a corner seat that I like, you know, on an aisle. But there was like one agape, agape sit, sit seat, and then a bunch of other seats were filled with human beings. And I just didn't want to be that close to other people. So then I'm like, okay, fuck. Either I don't see this movie now, because it was very convenient for me to see it, or... I take a chance and I get this uh, handicapped companion seat, knowing full well that if a real live handicapped person comes in, I will have to move and allow their real companion to sit there, or perhaps I'd be the companion of choice. So it's not that big a fucking deal, folks. I'm just saying that I'm glad that I took the seat, as it turned out, at 726 when I purchased the ticket. And I was aware of this situation earlier than that, but I said, you know what, I'm going to let this thing get close to the wire in case so many wonderful people in a wheelchair or whatever come up to the auditorium and the theater and they want to buy a ticket. I'm not going to prevent them. But as it turned out, all my fears were quelched. There was no handicapped folks in the theater tonight in the auditorium. Uh, there was a whole other section if they wanted to sit. And basically, I had a really good, comfortable spot with like this giant wall behind me because if you're going to the theater these days and they have like the reclining seats if you sit in that kind of front row like yeah it, sometimes it depends on the auditorium but like i had like a fucking condo to myself i was so comfortable none of the assholes behind me could monitor me um i'm sure that if i was up top i could hear them all chatting and so forth but i really I really felt like I had my own little secluded area away from these uh, human beings. So that was nice. So the movie was fine. I just, I feel like the movie could have been just a little bit better, like a little bit tweaked, and really had like a shot in the balls for everybody. 
But like I said, for what they did, you know, and sometimes, folks, I get caught up in the whole thing of, like, I start comparing these scripts to the scripts that I write or these finished films to my non, non-produced films. Uh, but I think with this one, I did like the 70s aspect. I did feel like sometimes the movies, and probably this one too, they overdo it with the 70s. Like, not every single asshole wore a big fucking collar in the 70s. You know what I mean? Whatever they say, oh, it's a 70s movie. They make everyone look very 70s, like extreme. There were some assholes in the world that were kind of not as, you know, bell-bottomy and horse shitty. You know what I mean? But that's what they do in the movies. They make it seem like every asshole had the flared pants and the big collars and the, you know what I mean? Like, like the s movies that are take place in the 70s always look like movies that take place in the 70s. They're not realistic because they over fucking do it is my point. Like every asshole has to wear polyester. You know what I mean? It's just one of those things that filmmakers do. They overemphasize, oh, get a shag rug. Like they go to the fucking well. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Any goddamn way. Uh, so the movie was fine. It was good. I mean, I just feel like as I've stated, there was a little bit, just just trying to throw too many things at the fucking wall. Let's throw the Coconut Grove out there. Well, that's like the whole movie, or it should be. Like that topic of this secret island with these creeps dancing around on it and praying to the fire gods, that's the whole movie. To try and work that into this, I just... Uh, because then it's like, oh, well, we have to go make our prequel. Okay. You know what I mean? So it's just, I don't know. I just don't get it. Anyway, I give it three and a half. I mean, I thought it was good. Like I said, the it was different. I mean, it wasn't your typical whatever the fuck. I mean, the fact that it's like got an interesting premise. There's a fucking late night talk show. A guy is competing with Johnny Carson. Uh, he's clearly way below Johnny Carson. So he's trying to get his fame up his ratings up and so he has this opportunity to book a possessed uh, young woman and how does he know of this uh, young woman he is uh, fornicating with her basically adopted mother slash uh, translator you know uh, spirit medium chick and then it's kind of revealed did he have something to do with his lovely wife's death blah 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 so anyway and I just feel like the movie kind of, it's its really not the execution, it's not the direction, it's not the actors. It's, I mean, by all means, the special effects were great. It's just, I think in the basic core of this script, like the actual script, okay, I think there was just one too many elements, and it was just that, that Coconut Grove thing. It's just you can't throw, like, shit out there so flippantly, okay? Uh, because you're going to have an asshole like myself who's going to call you out on it like I just have. So that's why the movie, as good as it is well made, it's just um, it's spiritually or storyline-ly missed a little uppercut. It missed a little punch, a little punch in the balls. So I say it's okay, you know. And the other thing is, folks... Once a fucking again, a lot of these times, the, your enjoyment of a film, at least for me, is you in my state of mind, your state of mind going into the movie. And I will admit, uh, just because we're so close and intimate here on One Mike Messier, um, I wasn't in the best mood going into this production. I was, I just wasn't feeling it. I was kind of in a um, state of mind, you know, and I can't really put a finger on it. It wasn't anger. It wasn't... Uh, I wouldn't say it was a depression, maybe a detachment. I was in a state of detachment. How's that sound? Like, put that on a fucking wall, you know? I wasn't depressed, I was detached. God damn it. Oh, I love it. So anyway, folks, that's it. Three and a half, three and a quarter, whatever the fuck. Um, but yeah, uh, there you go.